Take any organization that is confronting a crisis situation. And there are those who seem to perform fairly well. We'll look at those. And there are some that seem to really mess it all up. We'll look at those. The difference to me, if you drive it down to root cause between an organization that's doing well and one that isn't, always seems to be communication. An organization that is struggling is not communicating well. There's always smart people. There's always good intentions. Arguably, there's usually pretty good processes, right? So if it's not those things, what is it? It is that the organization itself is not sharing information effectively. It is not dealing in fact. It doesn't have a good, clean system to put a factual data set in front of all the decision makers. But more so, it doesn't have a compass point it's moving toward. Emergency plans, when you examine your emergency plan, they're almost always reverse engineered by nature. You get a group together, you go, what should be in this plan? Well, I don't know, we got a template from so-and-so, and it says, insert company name here, and I guess these are the things we should do. <clears throat> My question is, forget the plan, forget we're writing the plan for a second, and let me ask you, think about your own organizations. I don't care what you do. Let's just say something bad happens to your organization. Bad in the terms that someone's been injured seriously or worse. And you set about to manage that event. Three months later, you and your leadership group sit around the table and you say, how did we do in our management of that event? What are three things? Give me three. Three things that you want to say you did well, beginning to end, start to finish, top to bottom, right? Not procedures like, well, we called the boss immediately. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about big priorities. Don, you know, we did this from the very outset and we continued that all the way through and that helped us be successful. Give me three things that you want to be successful at. So, yeah, start with communicating with the family. Communicating with family, interesting. Um, the, the family piece, and, and what I hear in your message is kind of taking care of the people. Is that kind of what I hear? When I hear family, is that what you mean? Yeah. Um, everybody says that, right? We want to take care of our people, our employees, our crew members, our passengers. That is a primary priority. I think it ought to be. Who can argue with that? Right? There's no reporter out there that says, what do you mean you're taking care of families at this difficult time? Right? How you're responsible. No, that's one of the cards you want to put on the table. Guess what the least defined aspect of every single emergency response plan in business aviation is? Cool. That very thing. Okay. How to do that effectively. What that means. What resources are there? Can we spend money? Can we contribute the, uh, can we commit the company to action? How far can we go? Where does it start? Where does it stop? Who's trained to do it? Dear Lord, it is our number one priority in every organization and is the least defined aspect in our emergency plan. Whew. Okay, but let's do it. Let's take care of our people. Now, while you're doing that, what else do you want to say you're doing effectively? Well, no one else is. I would say facts. And dealing with facts. Not making decision with facts. facts. Yep, and communicating around facts. facts. Right? Your synthesizing of information and your communications. Dealing with factual information will drive every single decision you have to make. Right? I like that. We were maniacal about fact. Here's how you know from a communication standpoint you're living in the factual world. You're making statements in your executive group that sound like this. At 10.30 a.m., we received a report from the senior controller at the tower who said our aircraft uh, declared an in-flight emergency. We received a report at 10.30 from this person. People who are not dealing in fact say statements like this. At 10.30, we had an in-flight emergency with our airplane. You see the difference? You're clear about what you have, and you're clear about what you don't know yet. All right? All you know is you received a report. I see so many organizations jump to, ooh, that must be true, therefore we should do these things. I like it. There's two. We're taking care of our people. We're dealing in fact, and we're maniacal about that. Give me one more just to close it out. Sir? Media. What about? Well, dealing with the media correctly, I guess you could say. <laughs> You know, and uh, I always like to say, just because it's fun to say, 
that we don't deal with the media, right? A healthy communications program develops a relationship with the media. But let's be honest, sometimes you just deal with the media, right? But the way we control perception of our organization, look, you can't change what's happened. We have to come to terms with that. We want to, right? Incident, accident, whatever it was, onboard medical emergency that led to a fatality, whatever the situation is. Controlling the perception of your organization in this day and age is where brand protection lives. Right? How this event is going to be perceived, not just by the public, you know, we'll talk about the public in a minute, but the investigative agency? Is this a fly by night shop that doesn't have their act together that's all over the place? Or do they have a plan here? Right? They didn't expect this to happen, but it sure didn't catch them with their pants down. Uh, this is a culture that's strong. We need to take that into consideration. Trust me, investigations are a human activity, right? And we are, we, investigators, are influenced by our emotional assessments of you. I, I, you're not supposed to, I know, right? But we're not robots either. And, and when you see an organization post event that's all over the place, they can't get their act together, our presumption is, that's how you were before this happened. So that's extremely important. So there's, there's three things right away. Take three things, whatever they are for your organization. Just grab on the three things that you say are the big three. There's your plan. Ladies and gentlemen, that's your emergency response plan. All you have to do now is develop the procedures that support those priorities you identify for yourself. Nobody does that. And you can tell post-accident. No one sits down first and says, this is what's important to us. These are our compass points. Now we need a plan that drives us solidly to achievement of those priorities. All right, good stuff. Okay, we're going to try to have some fun today. Um, not every picture is going to be unicorns and lollipops, I get it, but this is what it's really all about, is that you work so hard every single day to deliver for your customers, to represent the human, compassionate side of your brand, and in just a couple minutes, it can all go away. Anybody know where this picture is from? This was an interesting, well, they're all interesting, right? This was in the Congo, but you'll notice it's a US registered aircraft, right? And slid off the uh, end of the runway, had uh, some principals from the Congolese government on board. Um, these international events are, are quite interesting, of course, because you have first responders and then you have second responders. The first responders are the ones in the foreground. The second responders are closing in very quickly. Uh, and as soon as the officials leave, these guys strip this airplane down almost nothing. Why? Because in the poorer parts of the world, sometimes this is perceived as the only access to something of value you may ever have for your family. And you can sell this part and feed your family for a month. I mean, it's, it's a whole different context. From a communications standpoint, you got to solve the, uh, the uh, dichotomy, the separation between, you know, the typical American expectation, when do I get my husband back? When do I get all his things back? When are they going to find out what happened with this airplane? In all three cases, much different than if it had happened in the US or Canada. They took everything, clothes, mm -hmm. jewelry, right? The, the occupants, some of them were moved. It was a, a really, it's just a different sort of deal. But Warren Buffett's quote is spot on. And that is, if you think about that hairline balance between a company that's been years and years Building a reputation and credibility can lose it in a couple of minutes. You'll do things differently. And I think what, what he's saying is, is you'll put more energy into the planning aspect of things. Uh, hey, look, put 90% into prevention. That always makes sense to me. Always. You don't ever want to be in this space. However, if you are, just as thorough of a job in how to respond to it and protect what's important to you. Business aviation accidents, ergo why we come together for classes and, and association events like this, they're different. I'm going to ask you a question because I've already become tired of talking. Why, why does the media cover these things with the intensity and the immediacy that they do? There is nothing on the news like a good old plane crash. Sensationalism. I agree, sir. Well, what makes it so? Usually it involves, I don't know, like spectacular fire and... The occupants. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 
So a couple things I heard. One is the shock and awe aspect of a high speed uh, situation carrying fuel. You know, we talked about how there's a very thin separation between occupants and the outside world. Um, these things are made light on purpose, right? They have to fly, and when they hit things at high rates of speed, full of gas, yeah, there you go. Let's talk about the occupants for a second. I think a reporter's perception is that whoever's on board is someone known. That's different on business aviation. Southwest Airlines, are they interested in the passengers? Mm, sure, but not near to the degree of something like this event, right? And so they're gonna pursue that very quickly. We'll talk about some tactics here in a minute. Uh, what else makes them different? Think from a reporter's eyes. So the shock and awe, the people on board, go a little deeper into the human existence. I don't think most people understand why airplanes fly. I mean, I, I, the truth of the matter is I have conversations with people about turbulence on a regular basis. I have conversations with wealthy, educated people about airplanes who are afraid of it. And I think because there's an innate misunderstanding of airplanes, it makes it very interesting and it proves a point, a, a point of fear or, or propagates something about aviation as not being in the norm. I don't know. I you know something along those lines. There's something there, isn't there? There's um there's I don't know if fear is the right word, but in a space where you're involved in a complex system that you don't understand all of the ins and outs of it, um, and things go wrong, it's it's extremely unsettling. And I think the media taps into that, right? There there are certain professional look pilots already in we don't need to inflate their ego, but I'm going to do it a little bit. <clears throat> There's already a perception of perfection, I call it, in certain lines of work. Surgeons, pilots, um, seems to be law enforcement sometimes here lately. Um, but there are certain professions where people just say, these people don't make mistakes. I mean, they, they don't. How could they? Right? This, this event is known to, to many of you because it's been... <clears throat> you know, drug through the whole uh, consultancy circuit, presentation circuit, has it not? What are we talking about here? No, it's, it's hands, right? Yeah, that's hands. Oh, hands. G4. 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 Uh, perfectly good airplane, completely flight worthy, off the end of runway 11 in Hanscom, Massachusetts. Slides across the ground, hits a localizer antenna, a couple of lead in lights, uh, perforates the wing, fuel comes out, ignites. Completely survivable accident. There's a there's an understanding that I think a press person says most of us fly on this complex system that not a lot of people understand. And when it goes wrong, and it's not supposed to go wrong ever, why did it? Because it's such a common thing to fly. And now we have a situation where flight crew failed to perform some pretty important steps before the takeoff sequence, right? Failure to perform a pre-flight control continuity check 172 times flights before this one. Do you know though, interestingly, in that data set, there were two times that they did. Isn't that interesting? Because, you know, I know that my former agency honed in on the fact uh, after pulling the QAR, quick access recorder, and they said, well, 172 times they failed to perform pre-flight control continuity check. Whether you're a pilot or not, I think you can perceive that's a pretty you know, basic thing. <clears throat> My question is, why did they do it twice in there? <laughs> Isn't that interesting? I mean, because I want to know what were the behavioral conditions that caused them to suddenly break from this huge deviance and go, these two times we're going to do it. And I wonder, I don't know this, but I wonder if it's like when we get a speeding ticket. Now, I know no one in here has ever gotten one. But when you do, don't you find yourself driving a little slower for a short while afterwards and then you get back in your old pattern again? I wonder if it was something like that. I wonder if they almost got burnt on something. But regardless of the circumstances, here's a, an organization that finds itself in a very small and private family stuff. And um, I happen to know a lot more about this event than I wish I did. Um, but these guys, the, my former agency, the National Talent Search Bureau, will show up. <laughs> and get in front of the cameras and start the communication game almost immediately. <clears throat> what are they after? The NT, well, TW800 changed a lot for our agency, and especially how we get along or not with the FBI, that's an option. But on the communications front, it's, if we're not out in front of this, everyone else is telling the story. Everyone else has already solved it before we had a chance to do it. We don't want that to happen. 
We want to look relevant. We want to show taxpayers the value. And then we want them to hold our investigative report with some degree of aha-ness. I just did that at work. But that's, that's kind of what it is. Now, these guys, we, these are the families, the <clears throat> relatives of the principal passenger. And from a communication standpoint, so just think, step away from the whole counseling mental health side for a second. From a communication standpoint, what are their expectations of us in the room? What do they expect us to do or not do on a communications front? Respect their privacy and tell the facts. Respect their privacy and tell the facts. I watch organizations all the time make statements like this. We will not be releasing the names of our crew and passengers until notification has been completed. No comment. Some of you get a little aggressive. Bam! You know, or boop, or don't call me back or, or whatever. <clears throat> You're not going to give me anything. I know that. So my worst tactic is to explain who I am. So I need to come at you a different way, and I will use any legal means to do that. I will tell you, in the U.S. anyway, and I believe the same is true in Canada, it is illegal for a reporter to represent themselves as a law enforcement officer, a member of the military, or a federal agent. That would include the FAA, NAV Canada, TSB, right? <coughs> But you don't have to do any of that. They're not going to break the law to get information from you. They don't need to. What they do is they'll simply call and say, hey, I'm over here at Signature up at Bedford. Um, what can we do to help? Now, your response, even if you're cautious, is going to be something along the lines of, I'm probably not the right person in my organization to answer that, but I'll send you to somebody who who can maybe help them. Maybe you're going to bounce them to your public relations person, whatever. But they already accomplished their first objective. And that is, is this you? Is this your airplane? Are you responding to an emergency? Because see, if you weren't, you would say something like, what are you talking about? for what? What are, what are we talking about here? Or you would quickly clarify and say, hey, that's not our airplane. That's not us. But you didn't do that. Instead, you reverted to your emergency plan. So now they know it's you. <clears throat> now they're going to come at you hard. Uh, and they're going to come at uh, a multiple angles here, and they're going to say, well, two things I need to share with you. One is um, every local media person who lives near an airport is likely a member of their local Red Cross chapter. Um, is it, Red Cross is here in Canada too, right? No, they're not. <clears throat> Survives on volunteers, right? So any of you can be a part of your Red Cross chapter. You get a vest. You get an ID badge that says Red Cross, and you get access to emergency sites. If you were a reporter, why wouldn't you take advantage of that? Now I can call you and I can say, hey, I'm Don from the local Red Cross chapter here in Boston. We have people showing up claiming to be family members of the crew and passengers. I don't know whether I should help them or if I should push them away. I don't know who's who. Who are we supposed to be helping here? Who are we looking for? You see how it goes. So that's just one of a couple different tactics that these guys will use. And that's how they get. The, the names of these occupants were on the New York Post uh, within the next day. I mean, it was hours. This thing happened um, late at night. I remember on my phone right. <clears throat> Look, it's not that the, the media is the evil empire per se. You can have your perceptions as you choose to. But one reporter once told us, a transportation correspondent, uh, lovely lady by the name of Lisa Stark, covers a lot of aviation accidents, and she said this, she said, uh, she's given a presentation uh, for us or with us, and <clears throat> she said, when you hear of an aviation accident somewhere in the world, what is your first behavioral trait? Somebody whispers, hey, did you hear about that business jet crash? What's the first thing you're going to do? Who's, who's, who's you're going to look it up. Right? You're going to jump on the web, you're going to turn on the news, you're going to do whatever. So that's what the crowd said. And so Lisa says, well, now that I've justified my role, <laughs> so there's something there when you do your research, I need something from you. I just need you to tell me what you know. And, and be factual. I, I don't need you to over-dramatize. I don't need to over-dramatize. She's like, I'm working in this space. I got everything I need. She said, you, you may not like this, but the whole reason I became a reporter is right here. The shock and awe, the, all the things you guys just, just laid out. Plus, she said, this story has legs. What that means is I can come back to it periodically because there's an ongoing investigation. Beautiful. I got everything I need. 
just need some basic facts from you, but what do you do when I call you? You hang up, you no comment, you refer me to some stupid website that has nothing on it. You give me some phone number of some person who isn't going to pick up the phone. <clears throat> she said, I want you to think of my job similar to you going on vacation and not feeding your dog. What is your dog forced to do? That's right, go through the trash. Beat the dog. And it was, it was one of the most you know, poignant uh, comments that to me drove home and said, you know, what we need to provide to people is guidance. It's one thing to say you shouldn't say no comment, um, but what do you say? What can you say? What is a safe space for you? Um, and as we're going to talk about here shortly, who are we talking to? So let's kind of get into it, see where it goes. Any questions so far? We doing all right? All right. So you go into a lot of organizations. Just put your brain around that for a second. <laughs> um, you go into a lot of organizations, you walk down the hall, you look at the posters that said people are priority one, safety and excellence in all we do. Uh, I've seen them all. There's a, there's a million safety promotion posters and all that kind of stuff. Okay, Easy to say when everything is good. What about when it isn't? What about when something happens that is not good? Have you fundamentally changed? Well, this is something you'll have to come to terms with. Have you changed just because you had an accident? Have your priorities changed? Ooh, reporters live in this space, guys, especially in business aviation, right? Especially if you're in the fractional or charter side, they'll pull up your website where it says, you know, safety covers everything. I've looked at a million, you know, from brokers to charter providers, and everybody, and they all kind of say the same things but different words, you know, safety's a part of everything we do. Argus is Bale, Platinum this, Wyvern that, whatever, right? Everybody's got these similar sorts of things. So a reporter loves to say, uh, I looked at your website, I noticed your statement about safety, will you be changing that now? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, you got that smoking uh, airplane thing in the background. One of the hardest things to do is hold tight to who you are. Um, and, and push that through the tough times, uh, especially for your customers, your passengers, your principals. Uh, they themselves are going to have questions, right? So you've got to hold to who you really are. And so part of your drill process from now on really ought to be how do we retain these cultural things about us, right? Is this just a house of cards? Are we really these investments we made in SMS and everything else? Is there a purpose? Was there a design for that? And it's hard because, you know, my former agency looks at these things and guess what? These guys were as Bayo Stage 3. They got glowing remarks on there. This is part of the investigation, public information, right? They got glowing <laughs> remarks. They said this, this organization is so professional, it's got the air marks of a small, well-run airline. These are 172 times without performing a there's a huge disconnect here with safety audits and, and real practice, and I'm not going to go down that road because I don't want to get shot. But from an investigator standpoint, that's something they're going to look very deeply and, and, and hard at. Okay, let's take a look at where it goes well, and let's take a look at where it doesn't. Is, any of this, is this picture familiar to anyone? It's pretty recent. Okay, just for anybody who doesn't know, this is in the East River, New York City. A doors off. More accurately, it should be doors open. The doors off photography flight, and I, I happen to know this, this um, not this operator, but the one that supplied the passengers for this flight, and they do some amazing photography work. I mean, the, the professional bloggers love these things. You can get pictures from over New York, like right over top of the Empire State Building and stuff. I mean, things you could never get were it not for this, this kind of operation. But everything's great. When life is good. One event and the entire world comes out from under the carpet pretending like they never knew that these operations have been happening for the last four years. The FAA, the Fraternity Against Aviation, one of the principal ones to come out and say, what? Doors on all. This should have never been allowed. Let's get into our meetings and let's figure out how to, you know. 
oh crap, in fact, there's video of the FAA looking over this whole thing about a year ago. Um, but typical government, they didn't give written permission for it, but they kind of reviewed it, looked at it, thought it was fine. This would have been fine were it not for this right here. One partially inflated float. I've seen these things in emergencies. These helicopters deploy their floats, stay completely stable, even on a river with current, and get towed off by a boat. This one, however, rolled because it had a partially underinflated float with doors open. There's seconds. 40 degree water, current. I don't know any person short of, you know, some highly specialized Navy SEAL or something that could have got out of that. The pilot did. Uh, all the occupants drowned. But when the pilot made it to the river, the first group uh, that he talked to was the Port Authority Police in New York. And they, of course, had their notepads, and they started interviewing him before he was even dried off. And they asked him what he thought happened. And his first statement was that he thought a passenger, the passenger sitting beside him, you know, in a helicopter, right seat's the principal pilot position. Left seat was a passenger, photographer. He said, my passenger, I think the strap from his harness, so when you take these pictures, you lean out from the door, and this harness keeps you held into the helicopter, basically. He said his harness, I think, got caught around the emergency fuel shutoff valve. Cut fuel to the engine. That's why we went into the river. The Port Authority Police, shortly thereafter, held a press briefing where they disclosed the contents of this interview. Now, put yourself in two seats. The families of the passengers and the manufacturer of the helicopter. How pleased are either of you about that statement? Families think what? Well, yeah, you're blaming my son for crashing a helicopter. Right? They go ballistic. Lawyers. Right? New York. Ugly. Manufacturer. What's the suggestion or implication here by that statement? Unsafe design. design. Unsafe design. Now, interestingly enough, that emergency fuel shutoff in the next-gen Eurocopters is up here. Okay, but we'll leave that for another day. But the manufacturer went ballistic about why did this pilot make these statements to the police, right? So it got out of hand very quickly, and it got ugly in about every sense of the word. You probably saw some of this on the news. It was just a bad public relations communications deal. All right. But on the other hand, you can have bad events, and you can handle it well from a communications standpoint. You see, in, in classes like this, a lot of times we talk about how not to do things, and you go, well, that's, that's bad, that's terrible, don't say that. Victims at this time, we will be working with our partner agencies to ensure families are notified as soon as possible and the appropriate supports are provided to those impacted. Look, everybody and their brother says our thoughts and prayers are with the families. I mean, you almost, you've heard it so many times now, you're kind of like, that's not even a genuine statement. An effective organization, when they communicate after an emergency, is able to say things like this. We have trained people engaged with those families right now, with them. Ooh. That's where you take a bad event and you start to manage the perception around it. So I credit the RCMP to do that. And I think if, if we could do that, if we take a look at our program and we start to understand that communications is not this silo that exists out here. It is woven into every aspect and tied into every aspect of our emergency plan. You're able to, because do, do you have teams doing this? And if you do, you make your communicator a truth teller. And that's a fantastic position to be in despite the circumstances.